So I'd like to, to welcome our guests uh, to Rowan University. We're, we're, we're glad to host you here today for, for this uh, event we're running. Um, we're excited to, to have people here at, uh, at Rowan. We always love to, to show off and tell our story as the, the third fastest growing research university in the country. Um, one that has transformed with Henry Rowan's gift back in the mid 90s to become Rowan University and then really transformed in, in the last 10 years to become what I think is a, a future national and global research powerhouse. Um, last 10 years are grown from, from 10,000 students to, to nearly 23,000 today. Uh, grown from a regionally classified master's only college to a comprehensive research institution with not one but two medical schools as well as a soon to be the first school of veterinary medicine in in the state of new jersey so it's really really an exciting time to be at rowan um and i want to welcome you and i just want to say as i as i talk about the transformations of rowan the the obvious one is is the gentleman on the statue just a block down in front of save its hall henry rowan whose whose vision said we gotta we gotta do something down here we gotta train more engineers and and suddenly we've got a a nationally and internationally recognized engineering school um but then i look at at the other transformative figures that that maybe don't get a lot of credit but they they should is one is we've got an amazing president dr dr ali hushman who has really set a vision to create the modern research institution. And then there's another person that, that I want to recognize, but I'm not going to steal the introduction. <laughs> but it's the gentleman sitting uh, to the next, to the left of me um, who has really done more for this institution than I can imagine Thanks. anyone else has, has done. He's been, he's been a leader and a visionary and, and as someone who, who worked as the dean during this transformation and then as the provost, uh, to be in the room with uh, with the Senate President and, and Ali Hushman and, and watch the ideas, sometimes my head would spin, um, but then run out and, and do really great things. Um, I can remember we opened, we opened Engineering Hall, what was it, 2017? Yeah. And uh, I, was, I was given some tours and I was saying how, look how great this is. We're now up to 2,000 students and we're at 15,000 students. And then we hand them the mic. And the number's 40, <laughs> and I wonder what it is today. But you know what, we, we could do it. The university needs it, the region needs it, and, and, and I just look at the things that as a university we benefit from. You know, as growing in this region, we brought a lot of jobs, a lot of people, a lot of faculty, a lot of staff. And, and as we grow in the region, you know, thanks to his leadership, we've got better schools down here. Our schools are, are more fairly funded, and I look at the jobs that are going out, you know, the, the burgeoning industry that's really going to be, I think, put us on the map as, as world leaders is going to be the wind energy. Yeah. So these are all the things we've done. It's all been done through partnership, uh, not just by bringing the resources down here, but by but Rowan as an institution stepping up and creating the programs in the, in the institution. So I think I'll stop because I don't want to take away from the introduction. But anyway, that's an introduction, and I, you know, I couldn't say, you know, more, but just, but thanks for all you've done for us. That's thanks, Trish. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Valerie Ruskansky. I'm a graduate of Rowan University, and I'm currently in its brand new Master's in Public Policy program. Uh, I have been proudly working as an assistant researcher for the Sweeney Center since last May. Uh, in the first two weeks of my time at the Sweeney Center, I was able to serve in our multi-year budget work group for its June 2022 report. Uh, comparing multi-year revenue forecasts with current service budget projections from 2012 to 2022, and having my data work uh, and charts displayed at a press conference in the State House, which was a big deal for me at the time, and it's still a big deal for me now. Uh, my research at the Sweeney Center has since expanded to a multitude of avenues, including school regionalization and jail consolidation. Uh, it is because of the Sweeney Center that I've been able to apply my research so meaningfully in such an early part in my career, and I'm very thankful for that. 
I and the rest of our organization are grateful for these types of opportunities that are owed in such a large part to a person who gave us our namesake, Steve Sweeney. Not yet. Um, in 2022, Steve Sweeney accepted Rowan University's invitation to launch a public policy center dedicated to developing bipartisan and pragmatic long-term solutions to New Jersey's most pressing issues. He represented the third legislative district for 20 years in this New Jersey Senate, including a record 12 years as Senate president. Steve Swinney sponsored the nation's first offshore wind act in 2010, the Vocational Education Bond Act in 2018, and the S2 School Funding Reform Act amendments in 2019. Steve Sweeney was a staunch proponent of Rowan University's unique affiliation with county colleges in Gloucester, Burlington, and Cumberland counties, and helped Rowan obtain the state funding needed to become the second university in the nation, as you heard, with two medical schools and a veterinary school. I am happy to introduce you today to a person who has been so beneficial for the equality and growth of New Jersey of education, and especially that of Rowan University, Steve Sweeney. Thank you, thank you. And, and uh, I'm, I can't tell you how excited I am to be here. Uh, Rowan University, for me, when I first started in politics, let me, let me step back. I got elected freeholder, then freeholder director. And you see the job surveys that come out. And we had light industry, we had heavy industry, we didn't have any tech industry, we have no pharmaceutical industry. And I wondered why, why aren't we why aren't we qualified? We got smart people here. And I found out the problem is we didn't have the degrees. You know, there's a lot of colleges and universities in the state of New Jersey. There's only three in South Jersey. And we had limited seats. So when I got the opportunity to become the Senate president, we made it, I made a decision along with a few others that we were going to make Rowan University the economic hub of the southern part of the state. That we were going to produce the type of degrees to bring the industries, the diversity of industries that we want down here. Because that was so important. And I, Tony's right, you know, I first told Dr. Hushman, who, look, you have to have partners. He's a visionary and I was a bull in the china shop that pushed to get things done. You know, because higher education is not really known for uh, change. In fact, it comes very, very difficult change in higher education. but. Dr. Hushman's vision, I said to him, I said, I want to get the school to 25,000 students. Now it's about 8,000, 8,500 8, students at the time. And you think, well, that's kind of bold. And I said, no, why can't we? Seriously, why can't we? What do we need to do? And then Dr. Hushman said, well, we need this. And we go out and get that. And we need that. And we go get that to a point where Rowan University, when we did the Higher Education Restructuring Act, and I see David Rousseau and Mark Pfeiffer here, uh, that was tried by several administrations and it couldn't get done, right? We did it. Rowan University winds up with two medical schools and on my way out the door, because elections have consequences, shit happens, I lost, <laughs> right? But I got the vet money for the veterinary medical school before I left which now has Rowan University distinguished nationally. So any one other school that has two MDDO and a vet school, I think it's Michigan State, Michigan State. and Rowan University. Think about that. In the same conversation, Rowan University, Michigan State. And now we're a research, we gave research designation. They're an R2 research designation school. We'll get to R1 and again, they're ranked, highly ranked nationally now. So, you know, the whole focus was the economy of the region to make Rowan so strong. When we started, Rowan probably had half the workers they have now, the workforce. Their budget when we started was 190 million, it's about 600 million now. That's all jobs, that's what created Rowan Boulevard that we all are proud of. You know, that was another project we worked to get done. So, you know, this university, we will get it to 40,000 students at some point because we're going to do some things that need to be done in higher education, which is partnering with our county colleges. Because higher education, all across the board, is struggling financially. And we have partners in our county colleges that we can partner with, and which Rowan has done, 
uh, with us with Rowan College of South Jer Jersey and Rowan College of Burlington County. Uh, I would love to see a rebranding of all of our county colleges and be associated with universities because our county colleges are really outstanding schools. But they're looked at differently because it's Gloucester County College. It's not a real college. You'll hear people say, well, that's BS. But, you know, I, as I explained when we did the rebranding, you put a polo shirt on the table and say it's 50 bucks. And you put just a plain white shirt on the table and say it's 50 bucks. Which one are you going to pick up? The brand. Because you think it's more valuable. And it has done wonders for our county college community. And we've actually created 3 plus 1, which I can tell you, when we started, there was so much opposition to 3 plus 1, which is three years at a, college cam a county college campus and one year at a university, $30,000 gets you a four-year degree. We talk about affordability, right? That makes all the sense in the world. You, you, so many schools we came down to were against it. I said, well, we're going to do it. I could get the bill passed because they would let it just be Rowan, you know, because no one else wanted to be forced into it. Well, what I knew what was going to happen is as soon as it happened, people around the state are going to say, how come we don't have something like that around here? You know what I mean? Especially with affordability. And I think William Patterson, uh, Ryder, a couple others are going to do it. And at some point, the entire state will be doing three plus one, which provides affordable educations for people. And again, partnering with our county colleges. But, you know, my fondness for Rowan really stems from what it's going to turn the economy of this region and what it's going to do for the future for for these young people and, and their kids. Uh, after my election, you know, I spoke to the university and said, you know, I'd really like to do something on policy. Because even when you're bipartisan, and I don't think anybody could say that I was the most bipartisan legislator in, in a long time. Uh, I wanted to bring together like the really smart people from all sides, really from all sides, Republicans, that are staunch Republicans, Democrats that are staunch Democrats, and independents. And we met for three months doing a budget, the first five-year budget in a decade, watching the people in the room that all have the different labels behind a door where they don't have to be partisan, we wound up with a unanimous unanimous budget, five-year budget projection, which, oh, by the way, we were right. Because they're predicting a slight recession coming. We were the first ones out there. They weren't my words. These were these financial experts, right, to where now I hear Governor Murphy talking that we're anticipating a slight budget, I mean, a slight recession. And it was so important to do that five-year budgeting because you know the legislature likes to spend. And in fact, we'll spend what we don't have. You know what I mean? And that's what's got us in a lot of trouble over the years. So going to the leaders, the Republican leader of the Budget Committee, Steve Orho, and Paul Sarlo, we, we showed them what needed to be done. And the result is a $10 billion surplus. Now, when the recession hits, we're going to be positioned for it. Now. If we hadn't done that, I can guarantee you from, no one likes to spend more than me, I can guarantee you that that money would be gone. And then we'd be cutting programs because that's what happens. And that winds up getting passed through and down to students like this where, you know, if I don't have the money, costs go up every year, you know, someone's gonna pay the bill. And again, that makes it less affordable and you know, New Jersey's the second highest public education cost in the nation. So trying to find ways to make it more affordable work better is so important. And you know, the reason why bipartisanship is so important is being able to count on getting votes from the other side, especially when your own team doesn't want you to get the votes. I can tell you one budget cycle, and I'm not going to tell you which governor, 
because I've been through a few of them. But they thought, me, they thought they had me locked down on a budget, that I wouldn't get to 21. They told one guy, you can vote on this, but you can't vote on that. You can vote on this, but you can't vote on that. It was like, it was a, like a puzzle. Well, what they didn't know is I had friends on the Republican side of the aisle. And when I, when I went to them and I said I needed a vote, they almost shit themselves. I passed the budget. They thought they had me blocked. They thought I couldn't get it done. And it was because of relationships. You know, it's always easier to try to find places of compromise, to be pragmatic, to understand. First thing I learned in Trenton is you're going to throw a whole bunch of 20-yard passes till you get a touchdown. If you think you're going to get a touchdown right out of the gate, it's not going to happen. You know, so working and finding ways to work with your colleagues on the other side of the aisle. I, I had members used to say to me, oh no, has to be 21 Democrats or no bill goes up. And I said, absolutely not. So I have four members will hold up the other 20, you know, because they can't, you know, they want something that the others don't. I said, no, no way, it doesn't work. But like I said, by doing that, we d did something that was pretty controversial, which was pension and benefit reform that earned me the scorn of a lot of people, but guess what? We fixed the pension system. In fact, we saved it. I was thrilled to, s to listen to Governor Murphy saying, we're making the full pension payment third year in a row. That was a partnership that started in the legislature. He's the governor, he gets it, and I'm thrilled he's continuing to do it. But it was a partnership. Pre-K, he announced pre-K. Guess what? That's something that we want to do that's probably more important than anyone really grasps. The younger you get a child, the more adjusted, the more intelligent, the more handling of, of, of issues, you know, they, they're just better. You know, and we're continuing to expand pre-K, which uh, was a dream when I started as Senate President. School funding, S2, the infamous S2 school funding bill. I just read this uh, story on the governor's funding of our schools. We went from an imbalance of funding schools, like schools that lost kids, kept all the funding even though they didn't have them, and schools that grow, grew kids didn't get funding for the kids they were getting. So we were creating the haves and have nots. I mean. We had schools where kids were borrowing books and the parents were paying 15000 a year in property taxes. And then the other school districts, they were giving iPads out to kids in the first grade because they had so much money they couldn't figure out what to spend it. And nothing gets fixed overnight. So this is the sixth year. Next year will be the seventh year of fixing it. And, you know, so for me, they gave me notes, so I got to look and at least say a couple things that they gave me. But, you know, th what drove me to get into politics was my daughter. I didn't like the way people with disabilities were treated. And people will say at times, if you don't like something, do something about it. But, you know, most people just like to complain. I did something about it. And we built schools for special needs kids in Gloucester County when I was the freeholder director. And we advanced programs for employment and opportunities when I got to the state including a program called ACT, which actually takes people when they age out at 21 of education, and it's a, we say it's a college for the disabled. And they go there for four years, and it's job skill, life skill intensive, and oh, by the way, they're getting jobs now. In fact, one of the things that I was pushing uh, before I left, and we're gonna continue to push, is the fact that government doesn't open its, its, its doors enough to the disabled. They don't, pro they don't do enough to give disabled people opportunities because when you look at a person with a disability, you look at them and you think, well, they're limited in what they can do. They might be, they might not be. If you don't ever give them a chance, if you don't ever have a conversation, you'll never know. Like we created a thing called Unified Sports, which Rome was recognized nationally as the top school in the country a couple years ago by ESPN, where you took quote unquote special needs kids and healthy college kids and they played sports together. They played soccer, 
and basketball. And the thing that would impress me the most is on a Saturday morning when I would go to my daughter's game is seeing so many young college students. This is Saturday morning. I know what's before Saturday morning. It's Friday night. And there was more students than there were athletes because they really wanted to be part of it. And the real beauty of that program wasn't playing sports. It was getting to know each other, you know, because we don't normally talk to each other. Like, you know, you look at someone and you're like, you know, like my daughter. Yeah, she has Down syndrome. She absolutely does. She doesn't have Down syndrome. She has Down syndrome. She's better with an iPhone or a laptop than I am. You know, so, so like they're the things that really got me going. And probably for some people in this room, they'll be happy we legalized weed. You know what I mean? But we didn't do it for the tax dollars. Everyone was, in fact, we got the lowest tax rate in the nation. And I'm proud of that because we're going to have the busiest market in the nation. We're going to have 42,000 people in that industry. And we lost the marijuana war 70 years ago. So regulating it, making sure the product is safe is more important than anything. I, I guess seven, eight years ago, there was synthetic marijuana and it was laced with something and a mother cut her five-year-old's head off and put it in a freezer in Camden. So ensuring that there's a product that's safe and is reliable is extremely important because we're not stopping it. So if we can regulate it, and in fact, Colorado now has 80% of the marijuana market in Colorado is actually purchased legally now. You know, they used to say if you could get to 50%, and unfortunately I should have been a bookie, I'm really good with numbers, I'm not that good with names. If you can get to 50%, that was a home run. Well, you can get to 80% of a market share, that's, that's awesome. And, and I, did a, I did something that I know didn't make the administration happy, I said, give the tax money to the impacted communities. They said, what do you mean? I said, give it to the communities that have been harmed the most by drugs to help them, you know, to help them come back, to help them revitalize themselves. And we created it so that the, the market itself will be more diverse because I can tell you 98% of the marijuana industry looks like me. And that's not what the population of the state is. So ensuring that more minorities, more women, more, more you, know, uh, you know, black, brown, yellow, whatever, have opportunities on these businesses is the best. And one of the problems we found with that was, right now marijuana is not legal, re legally recognized by the federal government. So there's no banks. They do everything with cash, which is a little bit insane, right? Everything's with cash. So we're like, we actually had to go and we said, well, we'll let hedge funds invest in them. And like, oh no, we don't want hedge, no, we don't want them to own them. But we need capital to get them started. So they can own a percentage of it, but they can never have the majority percentage of it. And eventually the people that own it can turn around and buy them out. You know, it was just to find seed money to get them started until the federal government decides to straighten that out, which is, you know, ridiculous. Half the states in the country, I guess now, are marijuana, legalized marijuana, and they have no banking system. The other big thing that I was really focused on is energy. Energy is so important to this country, to this world. Global warming is real. I was driving up the turnpike the other day. There was a rainbow. There was a tornado in Lawrence Township, and my car was getting hit with hail balls like the size of golf balls, but it was warm, so they, they, when they would hit the car, they would splatter. Otherwise, my, my car would have looked like I went through a golf range. You know, but coming up with new sources and new game plans to create the portfolio of clean energy that you can afford is critically important. Um, I was the prime sponsor of REGI, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, that brings hundreds of millions of dollars into the state. Chris Christie had taken us out of it for, you know, just for political talking points. And, and by the way, I'm, I was friends with, I, I worked with Chris Christie, I was friends with Chris Christie, but we don't always agree with things. Then we created SRACs 
that was the solar industry. And I was one of the prime sponsors of that to create a thriving solar industry that would get the state moving. And then we kept the nuclear plants from closing. Our nuclear plants were going to close. They provide 40% of our energy, right? And we're all talking about clean energy. If you shut the nuclear plants down, you know what you were going to get? Coal plants from the Midwest, because you have to replace it. And it's supply and demand. And if I don't have the supply, you know what the price you pay for it. And if you want to look at energy costs, just look at the Ukrainian war, what that's done. That's validated why you need to be independent and, 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 and balanced. And, and so, like I said, I was proud to keep the nuke plants open. But then we came up with an idea in 2010 to create the OREX, which is offshore wind. And to be sitting now watching this happening, you know, uh, myself, John Bersicelli, and at the time, Doug Fisher, we were the prime sponsors of it. And we were hearing about offshore wind. And you look at the map of the East Coast, and what does New Jersey have? Location, right? I mean, it's simple. It's not, it's not a tax-friendly state. It's not, it's, it's not a regulatory state. It's location. We're dead center. So the whole goal was to get that wind industry here, which, by the way, we've accomplished. A company called EEW is building 400-foot, five to six-inch thick plate monopiles in Paulsboro. They're going to employ about 500 people. The wind port down in Salem, and we made an investment, the state made an investment of a half a billion dollars there. Now we're building the wind port in Salem County, which is the second poorest county in the state. And we're going to provide probably three to 4,000 manufacturing jobs because the nacelle GE, which is the turbine manufacturer, is going to build a nacelle facility in Salem County. Well, if you know anything about offshore wind, these components are so huge. You're going to build, the president of GE told me, he says, you're going to wind up building all these factories right next to each other because you're not going to take it over the road. You're not going to take it on a train. So the only other way of movement is the water. So sitting back and looking at this industry is now finally coming alive. And, you know, the oil companies are hiding behind some, a, um, some uh, environmental groups. We're killing the whales. We're not killing the whales. I've read s reports from PhDs. What's happening is things are getting warmer. And the water is getting warmer, and it's moving the whales in. But the best one was, I read a lot of articles. One of the big oil companies has propped it up, an environmental group, to try to stop windmills. Right? So, so they're hiding behind this company. Like, we care about whales and dolphins, which we all do. But they don't. They want to drill in the ocean. You know what I mean? They want to... So it's, it's amazing what you, what you witness and what you see, you know, uh, as this goes by. But like I said, we're creating, we're going to be, there's not going to be five monopole facilities built on the East Coast. They're too big. They're too expensive. We've captured most of the industry there, which excites me, you know, that you, know, that, that you work on something and you see it come to its fruition. It's, 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 uh, that's what it really comes down to is delivering. And, uh, you know, like I said, elections are crazy. I helped keep the nuclear plants, cl plants open. And one of my members called me on election day. And he said, I don't know why you kept these, you voted to do this. I said, why? He said, because they're all voting against you. They're pissed off at Democrats. And I said, yeah, but I saved their job. Well, guess what? It didn't matter. But uh, look, I can talk a long time a uh, couple, couple, couple other accomplishments I'm really proud of. Uh, paid family leave. That actually came from my birth, the birth of my daughter. I spent 75 days in a neonatal unit. My daughter was two pounds and was born with Down syndrome. And, you know, people say you have family. We all have family. But they have families. 
And after a period of time, day after day after day, they got to go back to their families. So providing a benefit so people can spend the proper time with the people they care about in a time of crisis, it's pretty important. We did minimum wage with an indexing. So minimum wage will continue to increase with the CPI. So it doesn't happen where every seven years a government will get a conscience and say, you know, we haven't raised the minimum wage in such a long period of time. What do you think? Should we do it? Well, we put, we put a CPI in ours. So it it's automatically goes up. So it doesn't keep wages stagnant and keeps people where they can maybe, instead of, they're not, anyone on minimum wage is not living extravagantly. So maybe they can have chicken instead of some crap food. You know, maybe they can have better meals because they can eat a little bit better. So, you know, they're the things that really get me going, you know, uh, and, uh, and has really, I think, made a big difference in the state going forward. And what's most important is to make sure that you develop a product that both sides agree on or like. Listen, the Republicans didn't like the minimum wage. We agreed to disagree. But there's a lot of things we agreed on. And to develop a product that when the administration leaves or legislature changes, that product stays. You know, that legislation stays in place and continues to improve the quality of life of the people of the state of New Jersey. So, look, like I said, I've been, in, I've been talking for a long time, I guess, so, so thank you. Thank you, guys.